Welcome to the guest lecture with topic Understanding the problem on conflicting nutrition information through the lens of prebiotic. This session will be led by our amazing moderator, Dr. T. A. Siong as co-chairman of Saris Asia Probiotic Scientific and Regulatory Expert Network. Please welcome Dr. T. Time is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. We are now 419, yeah? So I did discuss with the speaker, invited speaker, that maybe he will speak for 40, 45 minutes. Then we can leave 10, 15 minutes for some discussion, yeah? So we should finish by, by 5.15 or 5.20, max 5.30 or so, yeah? Malaysia time. <laughs> Malaysia time, okay, no? Jakarta time. Okay, so this session, as Anissa has mentioned, we're going to listen to a very interesting talk. And when we first discussed possibly to have this talk, I was very excited. And because we are all, most of us are public health nutritionists, <laughs> researchers in nutrition. And, and we, when we talk to the public, another person talk to the public about nutrition topics, sometimes we find conflicting or contradicting information. One doctor say this, another doctor say another thing. So, Consumer in the end gets very confused, yeah? So understanding the problem of conflicting or contradicting nutritional information, we have to tackle with that. And, uh, and since this is the South Asia Probiotic uh, Scientific Regulatory Expert Network, uh, we, will, uh, we invite uh, Dr. Santosh to also focus on probiotics a bit. So welcome to this session, and we're very pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Santosh Vijay Kumar. Just let me share with you his CV very briefly. Yeah? It's a very interesting CV, and uh, you may not guess which department he's from. He's not a nutritionist by, by expertise. Yeah? He is from the Department of Psychology. So when I send this circular to my friends in Malaysia, he said, very interesting. You have a psychologist uh, speaking on this, you know, he's more than that. Dr. Stamtosh is more than a psychologist. And he's a nutrition, he's a communication expert. He's from Northumbria University, United Kingdom. He's now about 9.15 in his time, yeah? And thank you for waking up uh, early to join us for this. So he's from the department of, he's a senior lecturer and a public engagement lead in the Department of Psychology in Northumbria University, United Kingdom. He's also a digital economy ambassador for the Cherish DE Crucible program. Yeah, I bet you I never know about this program until I Google and found out about this. He's a health and risk communication scientist with research interest in the intersection of public health, behavioral science, and new media technologies. Nutritionists really need that. We cannot be talking among ourselves. We need experts in your area, Dr. Santosh, behavioral scientists, psychologists, communication specialists. Otherwise, we never get our messages across to the people. We can talk until we are blue in the face, never listen to us. We don't know how to communicate well. Specifically, he studies mobile and social media interventions for addressing global health challenges with a focus on tropical and infectious diseases. How timely. We are dealing with NCDs, non-communicable diseases. We're focusing on that for decades. Suddenly, we are bang, impacted on a pandemic, on infectious disease. Communicable disease is there, right in front of our face. So, Professor Santos is the right person to talk to us and his research is on his, his, his research analyzes and evaluates the effects of both these book innovations as well as generic platforms like Twitter and Facebook on individuals, communities, and health systems during infectious disease outbreak, such as the pandemic now. The research approach involves mixed methodologies, transdisciplinary conceptualization, and collaborations with policymakers, activists, and industry, multi-stakeholder working, yeah? So his work is in, including in Singapore, he was in Singapore for quite some time, in US, Sri Lanka, and India, yeah? Has published um, in various well-renowned magazines and uh, uh, journals in the world. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Santosh Vijay Kumar, speak to us on understanding the problem of conflicting nutrition information through the lens of 
probiotics. Professor Santosh, please. Yes, it's excellent. And thank you so much, Dr. Teev, uh, for, for the very kind introduction and for the very warm welcome as well. Um, I, I definitely miss my days in Singapore, you know, be, being yeah, kind of, you know, be, being able to, uh, yes, like pretty much meet up with you and Cindy for, for some uh, really stimulating conversations around nutrition. <clears throat> uh, so, so I'm just really glad that, you know, we, we um, you know, are, are still very much able to meet virtually now with you and your team. And I just really thank you for your uh, EOMAN work for all these years in, in the area of nutrition. Uh, thank you as well to Dr. Hardinsia, Anand, Cindy for uh, it's like for, for a very kind invitation. I, I know that you've all basically had a long day of meetings. Uh, so, so I just really hope that, you know, that I can do enough to keep you awake um, right now, right? Uh, yeah, kind of, you know, so... Uh, just, yeah, kind of, you know, um, uh, 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 so I'm just really going to uh, start by introducing myself. Um, I'm a senior lecturer uh, and a public engagement leader at North India University. Uh, and broadly, I really study how the power of communication can be used to address public health problems, right? Uh, but, but specifically, I tend to focus on two kinds of information problems. Um, so the first one is, of course, misinformation in the context of infectious disease outbreaks. And yeah, kind of, you know, uh, also situations like COVID-19. And then the second one, which is more pertinent to this talk is conflicting information, which I really study in the context of public health nutrition, right? And then so that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so before I just really talk research, you know, and I'm just going to talk, you know, um, I'm just really going to be sharing a, a bit of a personal story with you. Uh, so for many years, I've actually had a very close uh, relationship with orange juice, right? And I've always had it with my breakfast cereal, you know, an omelet, and I absolutely love it. Uh, until 2017, yeah, kind of, you know, so about like close to four years ago, when a friend of mine shared this article uh, from New York Times with me on Facebook, you know, and, and um, so there was just something really compelling about the way in which this article was written. Uh, just really evidence-based and strong arguments about why one should not have orange juice. Um, and then before I knew it, something snapped in me and I stopped having orange juice, right? But, but only till about uh, three months later when I saw another article in the Washington Post uh, saying that orange juice was not all that bad, uh, right? But, but by then the damage was already done um, and orange juice and I, you know, we, we sort of, I, I think you can say that we, we um, pretty much had a very acrimonious breakup um, you know, um, and then while I still do have oranges from time to time, our relationship just does not have the same passion, right? And then just, just, just not have the same magic anymore. And so that's when, you know, through this personal experience, I realized the real power of, of, of conflicting nutrition information. And, and I really wanted to try to understand this particular problem, this particular phenomenon in greater depth, right? Um, so, which is basically when, yeah, kind of, you know, through um, several conversations with Cindy, who was actually working quite actively in the probiotic space, you know, I basically started thinking about conflicting nutrition information and about probiotics a bit more specifically. Um, so, yeah, kind of, you know, so a few years ago, uh, you know, um, I, I kind of, you know, there, there have basically been researchers in, in the U.S., uh, yeah, kind of, you know, Rebecca Nagler and her team have actually studied uh, the, the effects of conflicting nutrition information quite a bit. Uh, you know, so they have also kind of you know, pretty much studied it in, in various different contexts. Um, and then what they basically kind of, you know, pretty much, um, you know, or really define conflicting nutrition information is as has messages that offer information about a single behavior and producing two distinct outcomes, right? Uh, and so while, while we all probably uh, conceptually understand this, I, I just want to show you a few examples of how this works in the mass media. Um, oops, okay, right, yeah. So on, on the left, you basically see an article from Time Magazine which says three reasons why coffee is so good for you. Uh, and on the right, you see, uh, you know, an article from CNN uh, from, from the same company really, Time Warner, I guess, yeah, kind of, you know, so which basically says that coffee may come with a cancer warning in California, right? And once you read this headline, you start thinking, oh my God, but, but I had already read that coffee is good for me. And then now these guys are saying that 
you, the coffee could cause cancer. Um, the second example, of course, you know, the, the unexpected health benefits of red wine. Um, and, and so on, on the right from the same telegraph about an year later, uh, we basically see that red wine is bad for you, say experts, uh, right? Uh, and so last but not the least, eating cheese and red meat is actually good for you. And well, the Guardian says, oh, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, can you know, well, well the, the Guardian says, should we give up re, uh, it's like, you know, eating red meat, right? And, and so as a consumer, uh, you can basically imagine, um, it's like, you know, what we are kind of, you know, so, so I think those of us from the nutrition community, those of us from the scientific community, we are used to seeing uh, conflicting evidence all the time because that is the nature of science, right? But for the general public, when they basically see a conflicting information about the same uh, food product and nutrition product or, you know, um, or a nutrition issue, uh, it actually starts, you know, starts affecting them in various different ways. And, and so the, the literature basically says, you know, that the conflicting information can actually affect our consumers in three main ways. Okay, the first one is, you know, it can cause a nutrition confusion, okay, which is really a perceived ambiguity about nutrition recommendations and research, where, where people are just really wondering, what does this mean, right? Okay, the, the second one is, of course, nutrition backlash, which is negative beliefs about nutrition recommendations, right? You know, so if a public health agency or if a food safety agency gives, uh, so like, for example, uh, you know, um, our recommendations for an ideal diet today and so on and so forth, people actually start having negative beliefs simply because they've been exposed to conflicting information. Um, and last but not the least is health behaviors, right? You know, so it just basically starts... Um, you know, uh, affecting things like exercise and food and vegetable consumption. Now, uh, so of course, like most research, you know, um, a, a lot of these investigations have been done in the United States. So, and then being in the UK, I basically really wanted to study, you know, how, you know, how does this phenomenon play out among the UK consumer population? Uh, and so that's what we did. We basically did a study among nearly 700 adults in the UK. It's like in between 18 to 75 years of age. Uh, and here's what we found. Um, so some of the top sources of conflicting information are, of course, television, you know, and online news and social media. Okay, but but of course, comes not too closely is actually friends, family, and coworkers, right? And and we, we basically also found that you know that people were exposed to conflicting nutrition information to a much lesser extent from newspapers or magazines, medical and health websites, and healthcare professionals and other sources as well, excuse me, right? Um, and then so what you see on the screen here, you know, is this really a structural equation model, which basically shows associations between information sources and, and their psychological and behavioral effects in the context of, of conflicting nutrition information, right? Um, so what we see on the screen is, for example, you know, um, that, that online news uh, so conflicting information from online news and television leads to confusion, uh, right? Uh, okay, it's like, you know, but, but at the same time, a conflicting information from health professionals actually leads to backlash, right? We also see that greater nutrition confusion is associated with greater backlash. Yeah, kind of, you know, so 0.39, uh, right? And, um, and then lastly, yeah, kind of, you know, what, what we also see is that a confusion leads to lower exercise behavior and backlash leads, you know, to, to lesser fruit and vegetable consumption, right? Yeah, so let's think about that for the moment, right? You know, so these are, you know, daily articles that all of us come across. And then we are just always wondering why, why does the media say one thing one day, something else the other, uh, you know, and then the, the research is actually telling us that uh, the constant exposure to this kind of conflict information can actually have um, some pretty worrying effects, you know, on how we psychologically process and then react uh, to nutrition information and potentially, uh, you know, on, on our dietary and health behaviors as well, uh, which of course I, I should note with a point of caution, I think, you know, there is a lot of, you know, a criticism about self-reporting in a nutrition dietary research and, and that that is definitely one of the limitations at least you know, when, when you look at the findings about fruit and vegetable, you know, and then exercise as well. Uh, so that, that I, I just wanted to just kind of, you know, put it out there. But but I think, you know, um, structural equation models are pretty robust. We, we did have some pretty strong measures of fit 
for this particular model. And, and I think from a, you know, from a um, psychosocial, from a cognitive standpoint, I think uh, it definitely points to the presence of a problem that all of us need to be talking about, um, right? Now, yeah, kind of, you know, so much like you said, you know, one of the nutritional issues um, and then one of the dietary products that has actually witnessed a lot of uh, conflicting you know, information around it is, is probiotics products, right? You know, so of course, um, uh, it's like, you know, there's an ICAP, which has been putting out uh, several statements of, of scientific consensus about the effectiveness of probiotic products. But we also know that in the recent past, yeah, kind of, you know, there have been uh, studies, for example, yeah, kind of, you know, from, from research groups in, uh, you know, in Israel, uh, which have just really questioned the, the ability, you know, of, of probiotic products to, yeah, kind of, you know, to, to sustain themselves in the gut. And then they've basically questioned whether probiotics products can actually, you know, uh, be, be helpful for health at all. Uh, you know, and so here I just really I kind of privilege again some contrasting headlines. Uh, one of which, of course, again from Time Magazine says, "Could probiotics be a new strategy for weight loss?" Right? Um, it's like you know, giving consumers a lot of hope, uh, but at the same time, yeah, kind of you know, the New York Times says there are problems with probiotics. You know, the Guardian says probiotics are not as beneficial. For gut health, as previously thought, the Scientific American, one of the leading scientific publications, says, are probiotics safe for your immune system? So that's a very tricky headline, though, because, you know, it's a very non committal headline. Um, and so that's both um, good and bad, um, you know, in some ways, really. Uh, and of course, last but not the least, yeah, kind of, you know, could probiotics help your immune system? Yeah, kind of, so very similar to the scientific American way of, of presenting a headline, right? And, and we, we just really makes people wonder because in the age of clickbait, right, you know, where we, we just really make judgments about the news, just uh, simply looking at headlines, these kinds of frames and then these kinds of questions can actually prompt a lot of uh, information seeking cognitive reactions, um, you know, in, in, you know, in news consumers as well. Um, so, yeah, kind of, you know, so pretty much over the past, like nearly two to three years, you know, um, I have really, you know, uh, uh, me and my team, of course, my uh, uh, yeah, kind of team, which, which is just really spread here in the UK and Singapore, as well as in the US, uh, we've just really spent a lot of time studying the effects and dynamics of, of the probiotic, you know, informational ecosystem, right? And, and so that's a huge one. Uh, you know, probiotics, we all know, is a, is a massive industry, generates billions and billions of dollars. You know, a lot of uh, hype around as well about what it can do, what it cannot do, a lot of debate. Um, so we just really wanted to sort of, you know, enter into the fray and just really try to get a good sense, um, you know, of, of the kind of, you know, um, a psychological effects as, as well as the information dynamics as well in the probiotic space. And, and so I think our, our research over the past few years can just really be categorized in two ways. So one is we basically did um, a series of consumer surveys you know, across eight countries in the world. Um, and and so, uh, so, of course, these surveys were huge surveys, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to be, going to be looking at a very, very small a slice of the data, just really kind of you know, prom, yeah, uh, prompting some questions and, and some discussions with you as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, social media analysis, uh, simply because, you know, uh, there has also been a lot of e-commerce um, you know, uh, activity around probiotics products, you know, the probiotics industry has actually been, you know, really, really um, keen to basically kind of, you know, to, to, uh, to leverage the power of internet and social media technologies to reach out to consumers. So we just basically wanted to, uh, to, to analyze social media data around probiotics uh, products as well, right? So, so let me first... Uh, Uh, talk about the, the consumer surveys, really, right? You know, so what, what we see here on the screen are, yeah, kind of, you know, so we have basically conducted surveys in close to about eight countries in the world, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. Of course, yeah, kind of, you know, um, countries from the ASEAN region uh, and Vietnam as well. And, and then, of course, uh, the, the United Kingdom, which is where this research started, which is where uh, it's like, you know, you basically see the massive sample size and in the United States. Um, and so what we see here, uh, you know, in the first slide, really, are um, some patterns, right? Yeah, kind of, you know, so um, we basically asked our consumers, you know, 
uh, please let us know if you've, you know, uh, how many of you have uh, ever consumed probiotics products. And on the right, you basically see a currently consuming, right? And in what you see consistently across all the eight countries is, is the fact that there has been a decline, you know, in, in probiotics consumption. And, and you can see the, uh, excuse me. Yeah, kind of, you know, so you can just basically see the decline being the strongest in the United Kingdom, right? You know, where 72.7% of, of the participants said that they, you know, had ever consumed probiotics products, but, but only 33.2% are actually currently consuming it. Uh, we, we just also, you know, um, see a pretty high gap in the US as well. And in the ASEAN region, one market to look at, you know, if, if you look, uh, you know, if you're just really looking for signals, I think one market to look at is Singapore. Um, but, but at the same time, the gap is actually the smallest in Vietnam and Thailand where, where consumption patterns seem to be fairly stable. All right, you know, so of course these are self-report measures um, and, and not based on, on market statistics. Um, we just also asked, um, are our participants to, to to rate their confidence in the safety, you know, of, of probiotics products, right? How safe do you think are probiotics products? And, and we again see, right, you know, that, uh, that, that some of the lowest scores are actually coming from the UK, US, and Singapore. Um, it's like, you know, but, but at the same time, you're basically seeing the, the highest confidence in safety in, uh, you know, in Philippines, Thailand, you know, and in Indonesia, um, and and you you can then basically see why uh, kind of you know so why we, we just basically also saw the gap in consumption in the previous slide as well. <coughs> Sorry, um, so then yeah, kind of you know so we, we just also similarly asked participants to actually rate. Uh, it's like you know their, their confidence, you know, in the, the healthfulness of of probiotics products. And then similarly, we, we just also actually see um, it's like you know fairly low ratings, you know, in, in the UK, US, and Singapore. But at the same time, consumers in Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam basically said that they were actually quite confident in the healthfulness of probiotics products. Uh, so it seems like that there is something uh, are definitely going on with the higher income countries here by, by way of, of a casual uh, observation. We, we just also, of course. Uh, capture their consumer trust in media coverage of probiotics products, and and so of course, yeah, kind of you know, so we basically see that you know that the the the, the trust in media coverage was actually you know it was uh, the the highest in Vietnam and Thailand. We asked them then about um, the, their trust in probiotic science, right? Uh, and so, so again, yeah, kind of you know, so what what we saw again was you know Philippines and Thailand, you know, the consumer trust in Probiotic science was highest, but but even in the U.S., you know, it wasn't all that low. And, and so the, the U.S. then makes for like a slightly interesting case study where I think, you know, people trust the probiotic science, but I think consumption is still um, based at least on, on the findings of our research. I kind of, you know, consumption has probably been dipping, uh, right? And, and then, of course, yeah, kind of, you know, a, a consumer confidence in government, you know, in, in the, the ability of government to actually share uh, you know, accurate and reliable information uh, about probiotics with consumers and so on and so forth. Uh, so we basically saw that, you know, that, that Malaysia uh, uh, and in Vietnam rated the highest and the trust in our government was, of course, lowest in, in the UK and the US, um, you know, for, for reasons that I'm sure we all know about. Um, and last but not the least, right, you know, we... Uh, yeah, kind of, you know, we basically yeah, kind of try, try to capture the trust in food manufacturers, which was just really, uh, it's like, you know, the, the highest in Thailand and Vietnam and in lowest in UK, US and Singapore. Uh, and, and so, you know, we are really now beginning to see a consistent trend where these uh, three higher income countries have actually got lower confidence across stakeholders, despite greater purchasing power. Uh, so that definitely merits some discussion. And I'm sure that, you know, that... Um, uh, several of you uh, know a lot more about the probiotics uh, scene in, in the ASEAN region that I do. So, so I just feel, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to your uh, sort of uh, interpretations, you know, uh, about why uh, some of these findings might hold forth, um, right? Now, 
uh, as we spoke, you know, I kind of, you know, so there has actually been, you know, a beehive of online activity around probiotics products, um, you know, thanks to the many e-commerce initiatives that, uh, you know, have basically been undertaken by various segments uh, of the probiotics industry. So that, that probably, you know, uh, includes the huge uh, corporates as well as um, a smaller kind of, you know, the, um, retailers uh, and, and so on and so forth as well. And and so what we wanted to do was we just really wanted to leverage the power of social listening tools um, to understand this online, you know, uh, probiotics informational ecosystem a bit more, right? You know, and then basically did that through some big data analysis of of probiotics chatter on on social media. Um, And and so, of course, you know, so... um, uh, so I just really uh, enjoy presenting this graph because I mean I think it just actually tells us a story in a nutshell. Um, so I just really think you know that the fascinating you know aspect of the whole probiotics world, you know when you compare it to GM food products, you know is just really this right you know so probiotics products I think you know there is um, you know um, been a lot of a conflicting information around probiotics products. Uh, it's like, you know, but, but despite that, I think we have basically seen, you know, uh, it's like, you know, some very promising uh, market trends, market projections and so on and so forth. And then of course, I, I know several of my family members, several of my friends love to step out of their house with, you know, with, with a bottle of Actimel and feeling all fit and great, right? Uh, uh, so there is yeah, kind of, you know, a certain positive sentiment associated with probiotics um, but when it basically comes to gm foods you, as, by and large i think there has been a uh, quite a bit of consensus around the fact that you know that the gm foods you know are no less or no more harmful as opposed to you know as opposed to natural foods uh, and of course uh, that there's a huge debate which you know which you can say for another day okay but i think you know but but despite that uh I, I think I can even, what, what this particular graph really shows is the fact that, you know, the, uh, despite the scientific consensus, the, the red bars basically, you know, uh, indicate negative sentiment and the green bars uh, indicate positive sentiment, right? Uh, so let's look at both these graphs. So, so despite the sort of by and large scientific consensus, it's like, you know, we basically see a consistent negative sentiment around GM foods, uh, you know, over the past uh, 10 years or so from 2008 to 2018, um, you know, okay. And then, like, but when it comes to probiotics products, though the, you know, the, the state of the evidence is still sort of emerging, things are still in a bit of, you know, in a bit of a flux, um, you know, we are actually seeing increasing positive sentiment uh, around probiotics products, right? You know, so there, there is uh, a really fascinating uh, sort of, you know, um, a dichotomy uh, out there, a paradox, if you will, you know, and, and so, of course, you know, there's basically been um, some really fascinating work done by some of my colleagues across the street in Newcastle University about how the small probiotics bottles actually inspire hope, uh, you know, and I'd be more than happy to, to share that paper with you as well, uh, uh, you know, um, at some point, but yeah, but, but I think uh, to just basically, yeah, it's like, you know, give you, you know, the, the contradiction in a nutshell through these two graphs. And then so uh, what, what you see out here are, of course, automated content analysis. Uh, we just basically also did some automated analysis of, of probiotics topics and influences in emotions. Um, I'm just really, I can't even, sorry about the fact that the, 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 the diagram that you see, it does not seem to be too clear. But but I think, you know, uh, um, so if you just really look at the lower part of the diagram, the green bars and the multicolored bars that you see, you know, is actually the social listening platform, uh, you know, automatically capturing uh, various sentiments, uh, sorry, or various seven different kinds of emotions, you know, uh, about probiotics products. Yeah, kind of, you know, from, from joy to sadness to anger to rage. Uh, and frustration as well. Uh, we, we just also basically see some some key probiotics keywords uh, in the form of topic wheels, and and the list that you see are basically some of the you know some of the, the automatically it's like generated lists of, of probiotics influencers. But uh, you know we we do see that you know that the automated uh, analysis of this kind you know 
uh, is actually very useful for, for, for generating some formative insights, but, but being researchers, being scientists, we basically wanted to you know, dive into the data a bit more using the kind of uh, methodologies that we wanted uh, to define, right? And then so, which is why I kind of, you know, we basically did a topic modeling, you know, uh, uh, analysis um, of, of, um, of probiotic chatter on, you know, in the UK Twitter space over like the past, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, past close to yeah, kind of nine years or so. And then what we basically see was, you know, um, at least when it, it comes to UK, a lot of the, um, you know, a, a lot of the chatter is just really uh, centered around discussing probiotics as functional foods, right? You know, so there is a lot of, um, you know, focus on some of the health, uh, you know, on some of the, the health impacts and then the, the health effects as well. Uh, we just also actually saw a lot of, uh, excuse me, I can, if you know, promotions related content, you know, on, um, you know, on, on uh, the, the UK Twitter space. And then of course, I mean, I think, you know, so some, some of the more uh, technical aspects received much less focus. Um, we then actually did, um, you know, a social network analysis, you know, to just basically identify who exactly, I mean, it's like how exactly are, are the communities around probiotics, are the, the online uh, communities around probiotics emerging, you know, what, you know, what kind of longitudinal variations are actually there in the emergence of these online probiotics communities? Because then we basically get to see a sense of how active the space is, right? Uh, and so what you see on the screen are, of course, you know, it's like, I mean, I wouldn't like to go into the technical uh, technical aspects of social network analysis right now, but, but I think, you know, for, for you to just really focus, you know, quite simply on the left column, on the, uh, you know, and on the rightmost column, right? Um, so we, we just basically say that, you know, when, when Twitter, for example, first came about that, there were just really about two communities uh, centered around probiotics, right? You know, but as the years rolled on, it's like, you know, there was actually more and more Twitter activity, uh, you know, and, and the Twitter activity, the number of communities peaked, you know, at around about um, 2014, uh, it's like, you know, where we basically saw about nine different communities. And then after that, you know, we have basically seen a little bit of a decline and then, uh, and then a little bit of like a plateauing in the UK Twitter probiotic space, which, which I think with, with the number of communities stabilizing around an equilibrium of about, um, you know, six to seven communities, really. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, we can also see the, the longitudinal patterns in the top hubs and authorities. So to just really give you a quick context, yeah, kind of the top hubs, uh, uh, you know, um, are just really defined as, you know, uh, as, as Twitter accounts that actually send out a, a, a more tweets, right? You know, so these are the talkers in Twitter space, you know, uh, uh, and in the top authorities are people who actually get tagged or get mentioned, you know, in tweets, right? You know, so, um, uh, I can, if you know, so, um, what, what you just really see out here are, of course, yeah, kind of, you know, so the, the Twitter accounts with high in degree values are first considered as authorities since uh, these accounts get tagged more in tweets, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, uh, what, what we really see, you know, in this particular series of graphs is the fact that except for the years 2013 and 2016, you know, Optibac emerges as a top ranked authority, you know, uh, in, in the UK. Um, we, we of course see that you know the, the the British Dietetic Association you know was definitely tagged you know in, in more tweets than an Optibac. Uh, I think in the academic from pretty much 2017. But but I think you know that apart from Optibac, uh, none of the other Twitter accounts actually uh, appear in the top five authority ranks for all the, the nine years, right? Um, and then so of course yeah, uh, uh, it's like we we can uh, definitely notice that you know the, the accounts such as Mercola and a new theory, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Nutra Europe actually appeared in 2010, but but they just also quickly disappeared as well, right? And and so you know, and then since 2016, of course, the British Dietetic Association has appeared to be, you know, a a pretty prominent authority in UK Twitter networks, right? Uh, so yeah, so so I think you know the the key takeaway from this is the fact that the the 
commercial entities have actually you know um, exerted a lot more influence you know in in the uk probiotic twitter space as opposed to for example uh, organizations like the, uh, the the british dietetic association which is just really come into play now um and then of course what you see on the screen here is yeah kind of so we basically try to you know um sort of plot out the, the in degree and in the out degree values of probiotic um uh, twitter accounts you know and an in degree is when you know a certain account is tagged and out degree is when you basically tag another account right you know so we, we are basically looking at, at twitter behaviors here um and and so it's like you know so we, we do basically see that you know the the um for the first four years, we are basically seeing that, you know, that, that there are actually more accounts with higher in degree values than out degree values. So, like, you know, since the account with the higher, you know, out degree percentage is actually below 50%, right? Um, and, and so I think, you know, so what, what this basically indicates is, is the fact that the tweet posting propensity, you know, is actually, you know, a, a lot more than tagging in tweets, right? You know, so the scatter plots are just also showing, yeah, kind of, you know, so similar to the previous figure that, that the Optibac has actually been a consistent influencer in, in the UK probiotic space, uh, you know, and, and so, of course, I mean, I think uh, over time, uh, it's like, you know, the, the, um, it's like, you know, some of the key accounts have just also tended to post a lot more as opposed to being tagged, right? Um, so just really, I kind of, you know, so what, uh, you know, in, in a nutshell are just really some of the key insights, um, you know, from the consumer surveys. Um, for starters, yeah, kind of, you know, so we do basically see a uh, decline in consumption, yeah, kind of, you know, so despite market projections, uh, you know, at, at least the participants in our uh, survey, they, they have basically reported a reduced consumption of probiotics products, which is actually quite interesting given how probiotics might come into relevance in the context of COVID. There has already been some market, you know, uh, activity around that. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, when it basically comes to trust in, in different probiotic stakeholders, levels of trust are actually the highest among scientists and then lowest in the media, uh, you know, and that that's a quite consistent, uh, you know, with, with some of the other trust barometers, which we have basically been seeing around the world by the likes of the Welcome Trust, uh, you know, and in, uh, and in several other kind of, you know, global survey agencies. Uh, in terms of confidence, of course, I think, you know, there are still fairly high levels of consumer confidence and safety, you know, and the helpfulness of probiotics products. And the confidence actually seems to be a bit higher in the ASEAN region, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, in the, the higher income countries such as UK, US and Singapore. And, and so that, that is, again, something that I'm quite looking forward to discussing with you. Uh, and, and just really some of the key takeaways, uh, you know, from the social media, you know, um, uh, analysis is the fact that, you know, that the online conversations actually, you know, or the, the online probiotics chatter seems to focus a lot more on the benefits um, of probiotics products, right? You know, so there is a quite quite a bit, you know, uh, of an information slant there. Uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, and in part simply because the space, you know, is, is quite populated, you know, with, with commercial entities who are actually exerting a lot more influence uh, you know, on social media conversations, right? You know, when it basically comes to influencers, yeah, kind of, you know, so much like I told you, yeah, kind of, you know, commercial entities actually wield the most influence, um, you know, and at least in the UK probiotics Twitter space, we are now actually beginning to expand our analysis to actually looking at, you know, at a Twitter uh, and then a few other social media platforms in other countries to just really try to compare uh, the kind of stakeholders who are actually at play the types of influences which is really uh, so wield a lot of influence uh, and then of course yeah kind of you know one, one of the worrying you know takeaways uh, you know is the fact that you know there is uh, you know a, a different information imbalance right you know so simply because in the community of scientists and journalists and policymakers you know who actually you know are involved in the probiotics ecosystem in such an active way right so scientists actually you know discover uh, it's like you know, some of the key health effects of probiotics journalists report on it you know and policymakers actually you know draft regulations around kind of you know labeling and so on and so forth 
And then for the kind of involvement that they basically have in the offline world, I, I think they've uh, like pretty much got precious little, you know, by way of influence in the online world, which which is a, a little bit, uh, you know, of, of a worry. If, if you know, if, if you all just really are kind of pretty much agree that, you know, we need to uh, develop or shape an ecosystem where consumers can actually make informed choices about probiotics products, uh, right? And so that just really um, brings us to the science dissemination cycle, right? You know, so what, what happens uh, typically, of course, you know, yeah, kind of, you know, so it, it's not the most a definitive um, sort of, you know, a, a depiction of the entire process. But by and large, what generally happens is scientists, they, they generate hypotheses, you know, and research questions, they, they investigate it and they publish it in scientific journals. You know, when uh the the evidence is published you know it basically gets distributed by by the the public relations departments of various universities through a press release which is already where i think a lot of the, the information distilling happens and and the public relations folks they send it to the news media and the news media of course you know so they basically give it their own slant based you know uh on on the way that they want to set the agenda and the way that they basically want to frame the news, you know, and once that is done, you know, the news basically starts spreading on social media and then finally reaches the public, right? You know, so that, that's of course sort of a, a typical sort of science dissemination cycle when it comes to things like probiotics products. Okay, but it's like, you know, the, the gap uh, as we see it is, is just really between the scientists and the public where we are really trying to say that, you know, that science cannot happen you know with scientists sitting in an ivory tower right you know so the, the benefits of science are accrued by the public and the people are also actually quite instrumental for for informing the scientists about the kind of problems that need to be investigated right so we are really trying to say that uh, you know that that scientists and the public need to start talking to each other a lot more and so there are of course already several initiatives underway but but based on my experience i mean i think you know that that tends to happen far less in the asean region as so be based on my experience in singapore for instance i think that that tends to happen you know much less uh, in the asean region though there there uh, you know uh, are a couple of ongoing initiatives um the, the public engagement sort of space has just really taken a lot of strength in the uk um, I, I do a lot of work around it, but but despite that, you know, I think when when you still go out, you know, uh, into the communities and when when you talk about you know a uh, people's perception of science and of scientists uh, and about the way science generates, uh, based on my experiences, I think there is a wide gap for all of us to address. At the same time, I, I kind of you know, uh, uh, um, the, the journalists. And the government, the policymakers also basically need to get in the fray to, you know, start talking about a controversial topics like probiotics products to communities a lot more, right? So, um, you know, by way of wrapping up, what exactly are some of the key takeaways um, for policymakers and practitioners? Yeah, kind of, you know, so we, yeah, it's like, you know, based on the findings of our research, of course, I think, you know, a lot of the research um, surrounding conflicting nutrition information has really been done, you know, in the US and our study in the UK, right? But, um, you know, we really need to start, start actively thinking about the problem of conflicting nutrition information as it pertains to probiotics. Because, you know, um, if, if we actually don't address it right now, it, it could definitely, you know, have a psychological, you know, and behavioral effects on consumers, you know, and then we definitely don't want to create you know, an environment where they are really not making uh, informed choices about probiotics intake, right? Um, the, the next takeaway is just really to, to invest, you know, in social listening, right? You know, so social listening is, of course, yeah, kind of, you know, so we, we all do our surveys and our community workshops and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, but, but given that uh, there's been a rise in e-commerce activity around probiotics products, I think, you know, so there is, you know, a certain case to be made uh, for uh, for probiotic stakeholders uh, in the ASEAN region uh, to to invest a lot more, you know, in social listening technologies where, where you can basically kind of you know keep monitoring uh, Twitter activity, Facebook activity, and stuff like that, um, you know, 
and then much like we demonstrated, we can just also uh, it's like you know, generated uh, it's like you know, generate both you know um, automated uh, analysis through a uh, machine learning you know and artificial intelligence, but we can also actually have a more theoretically informed evidence based you know a bespoke methodology such as social network analysis and and topic modeling um and and the reason why i actually specifically mentioned social listening is just because like like a couple of days ago i was at a who meeting uh, it's like you know so regarding the infodemic that that has now become a bit of a buzzword around the world right you know with a lot of online misinformation uh, it's like you know it's like preparing related to a whole range uh, of health you know of health related topics including nutrition and so the, the WHO, I know for a fact, is actually making a real, real push, you know, very strong push for investing in social listening, uh, or technology social listening approaches, um, you know. And, and so, yeah, so, so I think for, uh, for, for all of us, just really as a, as a community to just basically think about, you know, how can we work with each other to just basically develop, you know, more fine-tuned, sensitive social listening, uh, you know, uh, uh, approaches focused on controversial you know, um, uh, nutritional issues like probiotics products. Uh, and last but not the least, of course, uh, uh, the, the need for public engagement is, is to just really for, for the community of scientists, journalists, and policymakers to just really you know, come together, figure out ways, develop mechanisms to engage with the public and the communities a lot more actively, right? You know, so that, that has, uh, you know, in several contexts actually shown to increase trust in each other, uh, you know, and, and so I think, you know, it's a, and you know, I mean, I don't mean to be repetitive, but I think that there definitely, you know, is a case to be made for strengthening the ways in which consumers can actually make informed choices about the food products that they eat, right? Um, uh, or consume rather, right? Uh, and so, of course, yeah, kind of, you know, what exactly of from from personal research standpoint, I kind of you know so some of the ongoing and future research plans is I'm, I'm definitely committed to to investigating the scale and the nature of conflicting it's like you know nutrition information in the ASEAN region. Yeah, kind of you know so um, yeah, kind of you know so um, I've spoken with with Cindy and Dr. T uh, and Dr. Yeah, kind of uh, you know and Dr. Arden as well about. Uh, coming up with potential um, like you know projects consumer service to just really get a sense of how huge the problem is in the ASEAN region um, you know uh, the second one is of course creating pathways for sustained engagement between consumers and nutrition stakeholders using social media right you know so we are now um, I'm a part of the the national yeah kind of you know uh, 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 you know the the coordinating center for public engagement out here that kind of you know so there is a lot of discussion about how exactly can we actually leverage the power of social media especially in a context like for example COVID-19 where all of us are pretty much working remotely how can we actually leverage the power of social media to create mechanisms to engage with communities a lot more so that that is again something that I'm working on um, and then one one of the big ideas that uh, that and I'm developing right now in collaboration with some of my colleagues at Northumbria University is to just really establish in an online health information asymmetries, a knowledge and research exchange hub, right? And so the, the idea of information asymmetries really, uh, you know, encapsulates both misinformation and conflicting information. Um, so, so as well as a contradictory information, disseminate, uh, uh, you know, disinformation rumors and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, and so we, we are just really looking to to establish a knowledge and research exchange hub. Uh, it's like pretty much centered around this really broad global problem, and and so you know, I, I'd be happy you know to to, uh, to to engage with all of you if you would just basically want to collaborate uh, on an effort of this nature, right? Uh, and of course, uh, just really many many thanks to all of my colleagues. You know, um, I'm just really blessed to have an absolutely fantastic team. Uh, you know, and a very interdisciplinary team as well. Uh, uh, so these are also the two funding agencies that are actually kind of you know, pretty much funded the majority of this work, the Consumer Data Research Center, uh, as, as well as Pargizi Pangan, right? Um, yeah, so that's really all I have for you. I hope that this topic, you know, and the talk was of some, um, you know, uh, some interest uh, to you and, uh, and I'd just really be more than happy to 
uh, take questions right Thank now. You. Thank you, Dr. Satosh. Well, firstly, you did excellently on the timing. So we just okay. finished right 40, 45 minutes. And we now have good time, 15, 20 minutes for some discussion and very interesting uh, points you have raised, thought provoking, mm -hmm. some of them as myself, one trying to communicate to people on various topics, including probiotics. These are some of the questions we ask some of the challenges we face, yeah? So Secretary did say that you could type your questions inside the chat box. We have not seen, do, do we get to see the questions or only organizer get to see? Masancha, you did say we can see. Okay, and maybe no question at this time, yeah? But any one of us want to raise some points with Dr. Santosh now. I, I am particularly drawn to the last two slides here. Yeah? Yeah. That is the high point of your, of your lecture and about this gap, this gap between the scientists yeah. and the public. We can do all the research that we like and high-flung research and probably don't understand what we're talking. I think, and the policy makers don't understand. For example, I think we are wasting a lot of time. Maybe not wasting, but we, we need to spend more time bridging the gap. So you, you propose more, uh, you more engagement with the public. How would this be through seminars or what other things? Social media you mentioned also, right? Do you elaborate that on that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, can you finish? So there, there are at least yeah, can you finish three ways in which you know uh, I, I can think about it. Uh, so, so of course, in, in the UK, then there is like an entire um, a systematic process, you know, to, to engage the public. Right? I can, so one one is to basically kind of you know, pre, uh, it's like pretty much actively engage communities, you know, in uh, informing the kind of question that we are really developing, right? Uh, so that is just really one, uh, and so that, that's a blend of both you know, uh, uh, online and offline approaches, all uh, right? You know, so there are, of course, yeah, kind of, you know, so when, when you basically look at the creative aspect of it, yeah, kind of, you know, so we have been a part of, um, uh, um, it's like, you know, theater and drama workshops with school children to talk about probiotics products, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, it's like, you know, so we are in the process of developing a podcast, yeah, because science podcasts are actually something that, that a lot of people listen to, yeah. uh, 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 right? I kind of, you know, so th these are just like basically some of the, uh, uh, I kind of, you know, so some, some of the, yeah, kind of, you know, so small examples of how science can be communicated to the public, but, but just also, I mean, I think, you know, I just really also feel that when, when you look at universities, right, you know, there is, you know, a, a lot of uh, university departments actually have brown bag lunches on a Thursday or a Friday afternoon, you know, uh, and then mostly, you know, uh, one of the faculty members come, uh, uh, you know, and they present their research. Uh, uh, and yeah, kind of, you know, so it's like, I mean, I think they're, it's like, you know, colleagues are, you know, are pretty much the ones who are actually mostly there in that seminar room, uh, listening to that piece of research. Uh, uh, so one of my questions is, why can't we open up these you know, university seminars to the general public, you know, for, for oh. people who just really come, you know, ask uh, it's like tough questions of the scientists about, yeah, can you know, because uh, a lot of the science is also actually funded by taxpayer money, right? <laughs> uh, you know, cool. and yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, can you know, so there basically also has got to be some accountability, you know, <laughs> from, from the side of the scientific establishment to actually answer yeah, kind of, you know, taxpayers' questions, if you will. So, yeah, so, so I think, yeah, kind of, you know, so I don't wish to get too political about that, but, but I think to just basically, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I kind of, you know, so say that, you know, that there are both creative approaches that are slightly more boring approaches, right. which might, uh, yeah, kind of create, kind of, you know, some, some of these facilitating mechanisms. So, um, so, that, okay. so that they don't just stay in the ivory tower, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's right. That's okay. right. Yeah. Um, Any other points for other... Can I have a question, uh, Dr. T? Please, Prof. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Santos. A very, very uh, <coughs> a good and excellent presentation. Uh, there are two slides that uh, impressed to me why <laughs> the, the confidence on food safety, maybe this is especially for probiotic, yeah, 
or it is for uh, uh, all the kind of food. In Singapore, US and UK is lower than the other Asian countries, like in my country <laughs> also. So uh, uh, it's difficult to, <laughs> to my mind to accept like that because it is the developed country. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, it should be uh, have more uh, knowledge and food safety. Uh, why in the three countries, Singapore, UK, and <laughs> USA, uh, less confidence on food safety. <laughs> and oh. the second question also, uh -huh. why in these three countries, look like a parallel uh, <laughs> mindset there, yeah? that the consumption of food of prebiotics is getting mm -hmm. lower uh, compared to the current consuming. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. So that, that's a very valid question. You know, I mean, just also something that I've spent a little bit of time <laughs> wondering about. You know, I, I think I probably feel a bit more confident. Uh, it's like, you know, speaking about the UK and the US context, but, but I think, uh, you know, to make sense of this finding from a Singaporean context, I had, uh, I'd like, you know, surely like to, I, I kind of, you know, to, to invite the Cindy out to chime in as well with her thoughts. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, right, I kind of, you know, so from, from the UK and in the US context, I mean, I think, you know, there is, you know, a lot of exposure to media for sure, you know, and then people tend to consume media a lot. But but I think generally, I, I think there is quite, yeah, kind of, you know, so you might all probably heard of, of the, the general UK skepticism, right? Yeah, kind of, you know, so uh, 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 it's like, you know, so that, that of course, yeah, kind of, you know, so this is one of the more, a uh, cultural aspects by which it's like, you know, something like this can be looked at. I, I think people probably, uh, you know, uh, so I do, of course, think that, you know, one one of the reasons is the fact that I think there have also been, it's like, you know, uh, several um, uh, nutrition related controversies out, out here and yeah. in, in the UK as well. Already kind of so, like, you know, which have actually really fueled a uh, consumer mistrust, yeah. you know, in, in functional foods and stuff like that. Cindy, uh, would, would you like to talk about uh, Singapore a little bit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Santos, is it related to the vegetarian uh, growing uh, mindset? Maybe the, the, vegeta the vegan maybe have uh, a view that a probiotic is animal food. Is this right or not? <laughs> I don't think so because I mean I think you know uh, so one one of the things right uh, I mean it comes to, uh, it's like you know, so one one of the really uh, uh, fascinating uh, you know um, uh, observations that I've pretty much had out here in the UK is the fact that you know uh, that the UK government that does not permit the use of the word probiotics right oh. okay but at the same time I, I think suppose if I go to the supermarket yeah kind of you know so there is an aisle you know. A complete aisle which is called probiotics but but none of the products you know in that aisle will actually have the word probiotics mentioned on them oh yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah right yeah. Uh, yeah so i think that there is yeah kind of you know so yeah it's like you know i i do know at least of yeah kind of you know several of my friends who use probiotics products my own niece uh, she has actimil before she goes to school yeah. <laughs> you know and and so yeah so so i think yeah kind of you know, so there, there definitely is is a you know so, i mean i don't think that you know that um you know, it, it's a widespread um, sort of like a phenomenon, but but I think yeah, kind of several factors come into play. I just like uh, I just like pretty much including yeah, kind of you know trust in policymakers, trust in regulation, you know, uh, and and uh, a trust in media as well. Uh, we would would Cindy like to make a comment about what Dr. Santos mentioned? and also the ecosystem that we live in in Singapore. So in 2017, I remember there was a quite a, a wide study done by the Institute of Policy Studies in um, Singapore, um, which showed that the public confidence on authorities and government institutions in Singapore is very high. However, the underlying thing is that Singapore, although the uh, confidence level is measured as very high, but uh, the public is still skepticism to the to the agenda to also so yeah. uh, while the context of the study is not really on health information but it also shows that the perception the attitude of the um, residents uh, or the community living in Singapore the respondents 
to have a very questioning mind uh, behavior. Okay. So yeah. amidst that political landscape and the way the society is progressing, so that could also partially explain that, you know, the way people here think, whether it, uh, overall, okay. you know, the way the society here think that, yeah. yes, I do believe, yeah, the policy is in the best intention. I believe the trust in the government is high, but at the same time, <laughs> so that, that kind of questioning mindset, that could explain to uh, and could warrant even further research into the health domain. Yeah, so a lot of things to study and one, one, one size doesn't fit all, one solution doesn't fit all. If we want to engage the public with uh, more information. And there's a couple of questions here. I thought uh, Dr. Santosh, these two are quite linked. Dr. Tan Sui is asking from the survey findings, uh, do you see differences in this conflict of nutrition information? Are there some links or association with ethnic groups, eth ethnicity? And the other one, Dr. Suparman is asking, very, very similar. What are the characteristics? You know, is it linked to also socioeconomic level of the people? Uh, is there, do you find some association like that? Yeah, yeah. So, of course, yeah, kind of so we are, you know, in, in the process of conducting, you know, more, uh, it's like, you know, detailed analysis you know, on our data sets, we, we of course don't have a specific data about ethnicities, but yeah, kind of, you know, but, but what, what we have seen uh, is, uh, you know, is that, that there are different levels of exposure to conflicting uh, nutrition information across these different countries, for sure. Uh, yeah, kind of, you know, so it's like, I mean, and I think that, you know, I would speculate that a lot of that has basically also got to do with information seeking behaviors, and, and just as well, I mean, I think, you know, the, uh, uh, it's like, you know, there, there might actually be some cultures where people might be like, you know, no, no matter what the news media says, I'm, I'm just going to talk to my doctor, uh, mm. you know, uh, or, or I'm going to be talking to my grandmom to basically figure out, you know, if, if I should basically be uh, like pretty much consuming probiotics, you know, so we definitely see uh, a lot of, you know, a, a pretty strong role of intergenerational communication uh, when it comes to probiotics products. I mean, I think, you know, so it's just also basically got some cultural antecedents. Uh, when it, uh, 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 what, what exactly was the second question? Uh, the, uh, socioeconomic status, is it also linked to, yeah. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so we were just also actually, yeah, kind of, you know, so speaking of which we are, yeah, kind of, you know, in the midst of doing some really interesting um, geographical disparity analysis about access to probiotics products out here in the UK, you know, um, and then one, one of the things that we are basically finding out, for example, is the fact that, you know, people or communities from, uh, from lower income neighborhoods have actually got, it's like, you know, some much less, you know, uh, much less access to probiotics retailers, right? Yeah, kind of, you know, so we, which can actually affect consumption, right? You know, so there are, specific social determinants of health at, at the community level, which can actually come into play uh, in, in terms of the, the levels of, of probiotics that either yeah, kind of, you know, consumers consume or, or the kind of probiotics information that, that they are actually exposed to as well. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Satosh, you mentioned about social listening. Yeah. Yes. And you, you, you monitor the Twitter quite a bit. I, I even know how you do that. And uh, is there a software or... Yes, yeah. For for this particular study, we had basically uh, it's like, you know, purchased the license for a commercial social okay. listening software called Crimson Hexagon. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. It's like, you know, but but at the same time, I also do know that just, just I think about like a few weeks ago, it's like you know, Twitter has actually opened up their data sets to scientists oh, okay. uh, for analysis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'd be happy to share that link with you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so so I think suppose if you can basically get hold you know, for example, uh, you know, uh, of a data scientist who is actually skilled enough to, to be able to kind of you know, look at that a particular data set. I mean, I think that there is a lot, uh, uh, it's like, you know, to, to, be, uh, to, to be investigated and to, to be understood. Um, and, and of course, I mean, I think, you know, so uh, social listening also, of course, has to happen at the offline level, uh, at the community level as well, you know, so that that would actually be equally important because, uh, several of us are not on Twitter, right? Yeah, kind of, you know, several of us actually actively stay away from social media channels as well. So, so it's quite important that, you know, that our voices are heard also. Yeah, yeah. Also linked to the Twitter, you did say that there was mostly 
mostly positive benefit chatter, right? But yeah, what, yeah. What, what were the main negative chatter about probiotics? Health, hardly, safety concern, no? Hardly? Yeah, we hardly actually found a negative, yeah, kind of negative chatter about yeah. probiotics products. And then the thing is, right, you know, so, uh, and even if I actually keep the findings from our study, I said that there was actually another, a really fascinating piece of research that, that I think was actually just published last year. So, you know, where, where they basically did a content analysis of probiotics websites. And so they basically also said that, you know, that most of the probiotics websites actually give only positive, uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of, you know, positively inclined information about probiotics products. Okay. And so that that was just really a kind of, you know, one, one of the reasons why I basically said that, you know, to, to even out the information balance. I mean, I think it's quite important for all stakeholders to contribute uh, to the online chatter, right? You know, because uh, we basically also see that, and that that commercial entities are actually wielding a lot of influence. Yeah. B- 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 but but the folks have actually got access to the more balanced information. Uh, uh, it's like you know, such as journalists and scientists are, uh, are just simply not active, you know, on social media trying to, oh, you know, okay. like, uh, and I'm trying so. to even out the, the the information playing field, so to say. Yeah, yeah. So so why well, ask you this question? Because in, yeah. in, in 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 here we encounter several um, social media messages very negative. And cite really? one report, for example, one study that say that consuming probiotics can give you, uh, I don't know what's the term, the, the, the subjects became hazy brain and very fuzzy Ooh, brain, you know? Uh, uh-huh. that kind. There was uh-huh. one study, uh, I think very small number of subjects. So we okay. have to counter this kind of um, negative uh, messaging become very, very annoying. And uh, because, but I said, do you do one study, you know, but how do you, people get very excited and start chattering about this, you know, and, and get very, very busy kind of messaging to us because we do have a probiotic education program run by the Nutrition Society. So people uh-huh. are asking us, how come you never address that, that study? We did address that study. Yeah, so, so this- Yeah, are, yeah, the study, yeah. yeah, so that, that's another, yeah, kind of, you know, so to just quick, quickly speak to your point, right, you know, so, uh, I uh, said so that that actually uh, dovetails a lot with my work on misinformation, right? You know, so how do you counter misinformation, right? You yeah. know, so that, that's like an entire sort of science in itself. Yeah, kind of, you know, where we're basically using different uh, strategies with collective messaging to actually, yeah, kind of, you know, to, to address public misperceptions. So um, I, I'd be happy to talk about that, yeah, kind of, you know, separately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, yeah. I know. I, I know Anissa asking me how much time left. Maybe... Maybe just another five minutes, yeah? So there's a yeah. question here. In your survey, do people take more of supplement or probiotics in food type? Uh, so I think, yeah, kind of, you know, so at least out here in the UK, I, I think most of it, I think, was drinks or yogurts. Oh, okay. That's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right, yogurt, you know, yeah. But, yeah. but uh, I'd be happy to share uh, it's like, so all the descriptive findings with, with all of you as well later okay. on. Okay, and, and and the word probiotic is not permitted in the UK market, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I just don't think yeah, kind of not permitted might might be the, the most accurate way to put it. But but I think yeah, kind of you know, so suppose if you basically look at the probiotic part, I mean, I think that there is basically a lot of uh, it's like you know confusion about what's allowed and what's not allowed. So <laughs> okay. yeah, kind of you know, so one one day I, I just picked up the phone. I actually called up the the. <laughs> You know the, the advertising regulators because I was just really curious, right? I mean, and they, they actually wouldn't come to an answer as well. So, so I think the the the, the ju- jury is just really like um, it's like pretty much out. But but I think the uh, supermarkets are calling that category of products as probiotics, but but none of the products are self-identifying yeah. as probiotics products. Yeah, uh, it's like you know, so I'm not like really sure where. Yeah, or rely this, on that spectrum of regulation. Really. Yeah, this morning we also discussed that, and European Union, European Commission has not yeah. got a common law on allowing probiotics, but individual countries. Professor English shared with us a few countries in Europe, out of the twenty-seven or so, twenty-six yes. or so, have allowed that individually, but not as a common EU uh, opinion on that. Yeah, Absolutely. I think that's correct. We are quickly run out of time. Any more questions from other people? I don't want to dominate. The discussion. Okay, if not, then yeah, um, Radhi already here for closing ceremony. So. Yes, yes, I I would thank um, uh, Dr. Santosh Vijayakumar 
for sharing with us a very insightful lecture and lots of room for further discussion. Yeah, this is only the beginning, and let us build more on this um, on this topic and then engage with you a bit more. Yeah, Prof Santosh from now on and see how we can. So we don't have to wait for Europe to have the common uh, regulation. ASEAN yeah. can move forward, have a common regulation, common way of disseminating messages to the people. So less conflicting information if we <laughs> harmonize regulation, harmonize uh, messaging to the people. Thank you very much again, Prof Santosh. Yeah. Thank you, okay, uh, Anissa. Yeah. Uh, so, so kind of you, Dr. T. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Yes. Thank right, you very much, Dr. T, as our moderator, for lead the discussion, and Dr. Santos for our speaker to deliver excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very Ladies much. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue to the next agenda, we will have an online photo session. For all the participants, we kindly request you to turn on your camera as we are going to capture the screen. Once again, make sure you are turning on your camera so all the participants can include in the photo. I apologize for the inconvenience due to electricity problem in my home. So let's prepare for taking a picture. You may also smile at the photo as we capture and the host will help us to capture our biggest smile. And we are going to capture for the slide one. Three, two, one, smile. For the next slide. Slide two, three, two, one, smile. Last but not least. Last slide, three, two, one, smile. Okay, thank you very much for the participation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you very much for joining the guest lecture and fifth workshop on proposed regulatory harmonization of probiotic in Southeast Asia countries and update on current probiotic studies. Now, we are reaching in the end of workshop. Before we end the workshop, we would like to invite Mr. Adi S. Lukman as one of the initiator of Southeast Asia Probiotic Scientific and Regulatory Expert Network and Chairman of Indonesia Food and Beverage Association, GAPMI, to deliver the closing remarks. Please welcome Mr. Adi Lukman. The time is all yours. Um, uh, by Host, please unmute Mr. Adi. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Prof. Adin, Dr. Tishiong, and also Southeast Asia Probiotic Strands uh, community. So it's a great honor for me to, to deliver my closing remarks for all these uh, sessions. Uh, thank you for the contribution of all participants and especially the speakers in the fifth workshop on harmonization of probiotics regulation in Southeast Asia countries and update on the probiotics clinical trials. Spe special thanks to Perkisi Pangan who has hosted these meetings. Even though it was held virtually because the COVID-19 pandemic had not ended, we see that the participants were very active and enthusiastic in the discussions. We believe this virtual meeting does not detract from the meaning of this workshop. In fact, in the fifth workshop, it was increasingly conical to discuss various aspects such as harmonization of probiotics regulation for foods and supplements, definition of probiotics, positive list of permitted probiotics, general health claims, labeling requirements, for products containing probiotics, procedure and for application for new probiotics. From this meeting, it can be concluded that there has been increasing clinical evidence supporting the effectiveness of probiotics in general health maintenance and disease treatments. The market growth of probiotic has increased significantly as we can easily googling even though some of missing advertisings whether as fermented food or fermented food containing probiotics or probiotic foods. However, development of the regulatory frameworks for probiotics in the region had not advanced in, in the same pace. 
the lack of harmonization uh, regulation and scientific guidelines on clinical studies on probiotics have been recognized to lead to issues and concern for the regulators, industry, and even consumers. The benefits of harmonizing regulatory frameworks and requirements in Southeast Asia countries have been recognized and are expected to benefit all stakeholders, including facilitating regional and international trade in probiotic containing food and supplements, positive impact to research and development of probiotics by the academic and support innovation and development of products by the industries. Provide confidence to consumers, making available clearly labeled genuine probiotic-containing pro, uh, products. I'm happy to know 